Bueno, buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos a la conferencia de, de hoy y, y les estamos muy agradecidos debido a la gran competición que tenemos con el fútbol, o sea que es de muy agradecer su asistencia. Eh, la conferencia de hoy va a versar sobre el proyecto CLIC, que es el colisionador lineal compacto, que es un, un proyecto eh, futuro eh, de los posibles que para... Eh, para, para el CER después del LHC. Esto se enmarca dentro de, del ciclo de conferencias de, que ha organizado la Fundación BBVA, el CERN y la Secretaría eh, de Estado de Investigación e eh, Innovación. Eh, entonces, pues yo les voy a introducir un poco sobre el, sobre el tema de por qué Seguramente, o sea, ¿por qué tenemos que necesitamos nuevos aceleradores después del LHC? ¿De acuerdo? Entonces, lo primero es agradecer, como he dicho antes, en el ciclo de conferencias a la Fundación BBVA, al CERN y a la Secretaría de Estado de Investigación, Desarrollo e Innovación. Quizás si ustedes son asiduos a este, a este tipo de, de conferencias ya están familiarizados con el modelo estándar o con lo que es la definición de, 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 nuestra, de nuestra teoría que rige eh, las leyes y, y el comportamiento de las partículas elementales, pero déjenme que les haga una pequeña introducción a este modelo. ¿no? Entonces el modelo estándar tiene tres pilares básicos esencialmente. Tiene el pilar de las partículas que son las que componen eh, son los ladrillos de la materia, son los, ele los elementos más pequeños de los cuales la materia se compone. ¿de acuerdo? Son, y se divide pues, en, en, uh, en leptones, como son los el, el electrón, en quarks, el up y el down, ¿de acuerdo? y estas partículas eh, son, como he dicho, eh, lo que compone la, la materia ordinaria, en principio. La otra, el otro pilar el, eh, eh, fundamental del modelo estándar son las interacciones de estas partículas, cómo interaccionan entre ellas. ¿De acuerdo? Y están las, las interacciones del modelo estándar son la electromagnética, la débil y la fuerte. Y la gravitatoria, que sabemos que existe, pero que en el mundo de las partículas aún no se ha verificado y ni se ha visto fenómenos debidos a esta interacción. Estos son los dos pilares y también hay un tercer pilar fundamental que es el pilar de las simetrías. El modelo estándar se basa sobre todo, toda su dinámica, todas sus interacciones están basadas en, en simetrías, simetrías internas, que lo que quieren decir es que nuestras leyes fundamentales son invariantes bajo cierto tipo de, de transformaciones. ¿De acuerdo? Eso es algo fundamental para hacer teorías que, que son sólidas, teóricamente, en las cuales podemos hacer cálculos y podemos predecir nuevos fenómenos. Pero estas simetrías, sobre todo, tienen un efecto y es que no, son, no se llevan muy bien con la masa, con los términos que incluyen o que dan masa a las partículas. Y para ello se, se tuvo que inventar una, un mecanismo que se llama el mecanismo de rotura espontánea de simetría, por el cual, eh, de una manera digamos, muy inteligente, se podía preservar el buen comportamiento de la teoría y de las simetrías y a la vez, a la vez poder dotar de masa a las partículas. Esto llevaba esta, esta introducción de este mecanismo llevaba inmediatamente una predicción, que era la predicción de una nueva partícula, que era el Higgs. El Higgs no es ni un quark ni un leptón, ni siquiera un, un bosón, ah, se me ha olvidado introducir los bosones, cada fuerza o cada interacción lleva asociado un bosón que es el, el encargado de, de la interacción. Entonces el Higgs tampoco es ni se corresponde con un bosón asociado a una fuerza. Es algo mucho más extraño y que venía predicho en el mecanismo este de rotura espontánea de simetría. Bueno, por más de 50 años esta partícula se ha estado buscando y finalmente se encontró en el CERN en el 2012 
y en el 4 de julio del 2012 se hizo el anuncio público del descubrimiento de una partícula, si no esa partícula, algo que se le parecía o que era compatible con esta partícula. Pero una vez descubierta la partícula, eh, el siguiente paso es entender qué es esa partícula, medir sus propiedades y ver si exactamente se corresponde con la, la partícula del Higgs predicha por el modelo estándar. ¿De acuerdo? Como en el 2012 se puede ver que hubo mucha expectación, creo que aquí se organizó también un ciclo al, re, al respecto al descubrimiento del Higgs y se siguió en todos los medios como se puede ver. Ahora, ya varios años después de que se haya descubierto esta partícula, que de ahora en adelante me van a permitir que le llame la H125, en me, o el Higgs H125, nos corresponde entender qué realmente hemos descubierto, cuáles son sus propiedades, ¿de acuerdo? Y de hecho, hasta ahora lo que se ha comprobado es que se comporta muy parecidamente a lo que cabe esperar por el, el Higgs que está predicho en el modelo estándar, ¿de acuerdo? Pero esencialmente tenemos que seguir investigando y saber más de la información que nos da este, esta partícula. ¿no? Entonces, de hecho, no sabemos si es exactamente el, el Higgs que está predicho en el modelo estándar, no sabemos si es una partícula elemental ni compuesta, o bien está compuesta que tiene una estructura interna, no sabemos si es única o hay más Higgses, hay muchas teorías, por ejemplo, la supersimetría, que predice muchos Higgses con esas propiedades. Entonces, ni siquiera sabemos si a lo mejor hemos descubierto la primera partícula supersimétrica. Y para ello necesitamos realizar más investigaciones y más estudios. ¿De acuerdo? Es realmente la, res la responsable de dotar de masa a todas las partículas. Eso es eh, saber lo que se llama técnicamente si realmente es responsable del Yukawa coupling. Se produce principalmente mediante, mediante quarks, tops o, es, o lleva mecanismos más complicados. No sabemos si tiene relación con la simetría que hay en el universo entre la materia y antimateria y tampoco sabemos y podría tener implicación en la expansión inflacionaria del universo. Todo ello es algo que se tiene que investigar y es una puerta que ha abierto el descubrimiento del Higgs. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que necesitamos? Necesitamos de nuevas medidas con mucha precisión, que sean capaces de distinguir y contestar a estas preguntas. Entonces necesitamos de todo el programa del LHC, de la toma de datos que está haciendo, y además, como nuestros ponentes después nos van a presentar, de nuevos aceleradores que sean capaces de llegar a mayor precisión para poder responder estas preguntas con propiedad. Déjenme que introduzca también otro aspecto del modelo estándar, que es la relación de, con las masas. ¿De acuerdo? Entonces, eh, la física con la masa siempre ha tenido una relación. y empezó con Newton, entonces introdujo la, la masa como una, digamos, como la resistencia, como la masa inercial, eh, y, eh, de las cuales se derivaban las leyes de, de gravitación. Y como algo, como a la, la, digamos, la, la proporcionalidad entre una fuerza aplicada y la aceleración que adquiría un objeto. Más tarde, Einstein nos dijo que la masa y la energía eran manifestaciones de lo mismo y, era, y eran equivalentes, con lo cual eh, la masa la introdujo como algo, como energía condensada. Después, en el mecanismo este de rotura espontánea de simetría, con Broad Engler Higgs, nos conectaron la masa con el vacío, diciéndonos que el vacío no es la nada, sino el estado de, la, de mínima energía. Y ahora, ¿qué hemos descubierto en 2014? con las medidas de la masa del quartop y la masa del Higgs, ya hemos descubierto o, o tenemos la sensación, hemos medido, de que quizás nuestro universo no sea tan estable como creemos y que está en un estado de metaestabilidad. Quiere decir que en algún momento eh, podría, eh, se podría desintegrar. Eh, no obstante, eh, no sé si es un riesgo para llegar a la a la jubilación, un riesgo añadido ahora que tenemos al haber descubierto eso. Pero de todas maneras, yo lo que, lo que quiero pensar es que esto es una limitación de nuestro modelo estándar que nos está diciendo dónde falla y dónde empieza a ser necesario una nueva teoría. Una nueva teoría que introduzca términos que corrijan estas inconsistencias. Y la otra también aspecto que limita y que el modelo estándar de ahí está muy limitado y que creo que ustedes también 
seguro que están muy familiarizados, es la existencia de la materia oscura. Ya en los años 30 se vio que las velocidades orbitales de, de las galaxias no se correspondían con la, eh, con la masa de las, de las estrellas y las galaxias visibles. ¿De acuerdo? Entonces tenía que haber una masa, tenía que haber unos objetos que no podíamos observar y que eran responsables de ese movimiento. Después se han repetido esos experimentos y se ha confirmado la existencia de esa especie de materia oscura, eh, incluso con, con experimentos muy, muy delicados y, y bastante bonitos usando pues, lo que se llama lentes gravitacionales. En el modelo estándar que tenemos ahora, no existe ningún candidato a explicar esa materia oscura. Es decir, si esto ya limita lo que es nuestro modelo estándar y hace falta algo que lo incluya. Entonces, ¿qué, qué ocurre? Pues después de muchos años se ha, eh, se ha realizado un exitoso programa de investigación con una gran inversión de recursos y estudios y muchos aceleradores eh, en distintas partes del mundo. ¿de acuerdo? Esto se ha culminado con la, el descubrimiento de esta partícula nueva que llamaremos el Higgs H125. Sin embargo, para lo que está sirviendo realmente es para descubrir ahora los límites de nuestro, de nuestro conocimiento y para abrir nuevas puertas y para ser conscientes, ser más conscientes y tener mejor definido cuáles son nuestros objetivos futuros. Entonces, nuestras preguntas fundamentales para el desarrollo de los próximos años en física de partículas es qué establece la masa del bosón de Higgs, es elemental o compuesto, cuál es el mecanismo que rige la rotura espontánea de simetría, hay un Higgs o hay más, la estabilidad del universo, cuál es la naturaleza de la materia oscura, qué rige la inflación del universo y por qué solo hay materia en el universo. ¿Cuáles son nuestras mejores herramientas que tenemos? Las mejores herramientas son las partículas que hemos descubierto, pero que ahora nos sirven para estudiar bien sus propiedades. Ellos son esta partícula descubierta como el Higgs, el Quartop, los bosones WZ, el fotón y también la búsqueda directa de nueva física, ¿eh? mediante efectos y fenómenos nuevos. Todo ello, ¿qué nos implica? Pues tenemos que utilizar nuevos instrumentos, aquellos a nuestras herramientas, nuestros nuevos instrumentos son nuevos aceleradores, ¿de acuerdo? Existen nuevos aceleradores o ideas o proyectos como colisiones de protón-protón o colisiones eh, electrón-positrón. Eh, en el pasado, este tipo de aceleradores se han ido complementando y dando infra, y información eh, cada, para los dos. En la actualidad y en operación está el LHC, que es un colisionador protón-protón y tiene una, una fase que además se ha aprobado recientemente, la semana pasada, sobre, eh, y, eh, sobre la fase 2 de la alta luminosidad. Y también hay una propuesta para el futuro acelerador del CER, que creo que será una de las charlas también que se darán en este ciclo, sobre la future eh, la futuro, el futuro colisionador circular del CERN adrónico, que correspondería a una energía de 100 temps. Aquí en esta columna vemos las propuestas y proyectos que hay para, para el futuro eh, en E más en menos. Primero hay colisionadores lineales, son aceleradores que son lineales, que ahora en la charla de, de los próximos ponentes pues nos, eh, nos hablarán de, de uno de ellos, y los colisionadores circulares. Ellos están en distintas fases de madurez, de, de, de entendimiento tecnológico, así pues eh, el colisionador internacional consta de, de, un, de un documento técnico, con lo cual pues quiere decir que es, una, es un acelerador o una máquina que se podría empezar a construir si hubieran los fondos y si realmente la comunidad lo, lo indicara así. Está CLIC, el acelerador lineal compacto, ¿Eh? que es la propuesta del CER para este tipo de aceleradores y que es el, el tema de hoy y en el que existe lo que se llama el, el diseño eh, conceptual también. Y en fases mucho más preliminares están las, los eh, aceleradores circulares, uno propuesto en China y el otro propuesto también en el CERN en correlación con el, con el adrónico que he mencionado anteriormente. También, antes de, de finalizar, me gustaría mencionar eh, que en España se está haciendo un gran esfuerzo por también eh, colaborar 
en, es, en, digamos, en la previsión y en los estudios hacia cuál podría ser la próxima inversión del campo en un próximo acelerador. Entonces, digamos que eh, España está, estamos trabajando en torno a una red, existe la red que se llama de futuros colisionadores, cuyo objetivo principal en estos momentos es facilitar la comunicación de los distintos grupos y, y también digamos, incentivar la cooperación entre ellos en todas las facetas, tanto desde el tipo de acelerador, los de, el estudio de detectores, el estudio de la física y también el interés industrial. Entonces, aquí hay pues, algunos de los grupos que, que participan en este esfuerzo. Y ahora ya para finalizar, déjenme que les introduzca los, los ponentes que les van a hablar del proyecto CLIC, del, del Compact Linear Collider, y son los doctores Steiner Stapnes y la doctora Lucy Linsen. Los dos son, eh, pertenecen al, al CERN, trabajan en el CERN. El doctor Steiner Stepnes es el director asociado del estudio de, para colisionadores lineales compactos. Y la doctora Lucy Linsen es, eh, es la jefa de, del, del grupo que hace el estudio de los detectores y la física de colisionadores en CLIC. Respecto un poco a su, a su currículum, pues eh, el doctor Stepnes es el director del grupo del CER para actividades de I más D en los proyectos del, del colisionador lineal, tanto el ILC como el CLIC. Fue doctor por la Universidad de Oslo en 1991. El, es una persona que hemos cooperado en los mismos experimentos en los que he estado yo y nos conocemos además desde hace mucho tiempo, desde Delphi, Atlas, CLIC y en todos ellos ha, ha tenido pues, siempre responsabilidades muy visibles y de gran impacto. ¿no? Entonces, eh, es, ha sido presidente de la Sociedad Noruega de Física, ha llevado y ha sido investigador principal de muchos proyectos eh, de la Unión Europea, es viceportavoz, fue viceportavoz de Atlas y en un momento también era la persona que actuaba como secretario para el seguimiento y aplicación de la estrategia europea en física partículas. La, la doctora eh, Linsen, es, es, obtuvo el doctorado por la Universidad de Ámsterdam en 1986, ha estado en los experimentos y ha tenido proyectos europeos para el desarrollo de nuevos detectores, en NOMAD, ahora en CLIC, y también ha tenido responsabilidades como investigadora principal en, en proyectos europeos de desarrollo para futuros detectores, responsable de la relación entre Europa y Rusia en materia de detectores y ahora es portavoz de la colaboración para el detector y la física de CLIC. Y sin más eh, preámbulo, pues ya le doy la palabra al doctor Stamnes. Good evening, everybody. Um, I will the talk. The seminar today is about the compact linear collider, CLIC, which is uh, one of the future projects being evaluated for potentially being. Um, implemented at CERN after LHC. As you know, today at CERN, uh, we are all busy. We are operating LHC, which is a 27-kilometer circular collider. But CLIC is a linear collider. So if you look at this picture from Google, here you see the, the footprint of LHC, the 27 kilometers. And here you see a long line with three different colors which would be the three possible implementation stages of the CLIC project. So, and if, uh, and the natural start of that project will be something like a 10 kilometer uh, accelerator then being expanded over a time period of something like 25 years up to 50 kilometers. So the total length of this is a 50 kilometer accelerator. And here you see an artist impression of how this would look along the foot of the Jura Mountains here which, of course, this is also uh, something like 100 to 150 meters below ground. Now, why do we build accelerators? Uh, this is, of course, we do that to study our universe, and we try to study the universe in various ways, but accelerator is a particular powerful tool. It's, uh, uh, and they are expensive. They are the biggest scientific instruments, I believe, we have today. Uh, and the reason why we find them uh, so useful for us is that we believe that the universe has developed through, uh, from a big bang very quick 
uh, expansion into the universe we know today, over something like 13.7 billion years. And by colliding particles in an accelerator and using Einstein's uh, formula where we can go from the mass of these particles into energy and create new particles, we can create all kinds of particles at very high energies. In fact, we, we go back to energy density, which has happened something like a million of a million to, of a second after the Big Bang. So we go back and study our universe at close to uh, the start of the universe. And this tells us and gives us constraints of how the universe looks today. There's another aspect of accelerators. We live on a, on a, on a, a scale of something like meters or kilometers. Uh, but the universe we know is incre incredibly big. And we study the universe in many different ways uh, through also large instruments, uh, telescopes, uh, and all kind of, of uh, instruments looking at the radiation from the sky in, in, dif in different forms. Uh, on the other scale, we also need big instruments. We go from, we go from uh, glasses, magnifying glasses, we go down to microscopes, and we go down, down to accelerators. And the reason, uh, and by doing that, we go down in scale. So we study uh, matter at its most fundamental level, at its, the const, what, what uh, matter is really built up from. And we study how these fundamental parts of the universe interact. So it tells us about matter itself and the interactions between matter on a very fundamental form. And the reason we can do that is that the wavelength, uh, as you know, uh, a particle or a, a fundamental particle is both a particle and a wave, and the wavelength is decreasing when we go up in energy. So if you have higher and higher energy, we get a, a smaller and smaller wavelength, and we can study the matter down to the 10 to the minus 18 meters. So by doing that, by building this accelerator, it allows us to do all these kind of investigations in a controlled way. We, we, we create these particles, we collide them, we see what comes out, we see how they are constructed, and we see how they interact among themselves. So then the question is, how, what are the best possible accelerators? Uh, and there, there are many different opinions, but what we are going to, uh, what we are going to talk about today is a linear accelerator colliding electrons and positrons. In fact, there are not so many particles we can accelerate. To accelerate a particle, you need a particle which is stable, because you need something which doesn't interact and uh, is uh, split into parts uh, right away. And in fact, the, the choices made are usually to use a proton or an electron. So in fact, in the hydrogen atom, you have the two. Uh, we know it's a stable construction. Uh, and and the proton and electrons are both stable. Of course, we can consider using other ones, but these are the most, most used by far. Now, the proton collisions uh, are quite complex because a proton is, in fact, quite a complicated package. It consists of quarks, particles interacting between the quarks, and there are also anti-quarks popping up. So if you collide a proton with a proton, you, co you collide two quite complicated packages. And Lucy will come back to that in her presentation, uh, more about the difficulty of that. So on the other hand, if you go for electrons, uh, we cannot, we have to collide electrons and positrons, because we want to create something which is neutral. And this is a particle and an antiparticle of each other. And, and these are fundamental particles. So they are not consisting of any other particles, as we know it today, at least. So we have a well-defined initial condition, we have well-defined energy, and we also have less background. So clearly, that has many advantages. We do have a machine uh, uh, colliding protons, LHC. So obviously, in the science uh, of particle physics, I think there's a full agreement, at least, that we need an electron-positron uh, accelerator to be able to move forward in, in, uh, in our research. Now, how do we control the particles? In, uh, so I'm afraid I have to put up a formula for that. Um, but the formula is, is a fairly simple one. It's the force acting on a particle with a velocity v and a charge q. So you need, we need a charged particle moving along at a certain velocity. And if you expose that particle to an electric field, uh, we can obtain acceleration. Or to a magnetic field, 
we can bend the particles. This is coming out of this formula. So, in fact, uh, the reason why we cannot use magnetic fields to, uh, to accelerate the particle is that this formula tells us the uh, magnetic field will act perpendicular to the speed of the particle and we will not be able to increase the speed. So to increase the speed of the particle, you have to use electrical fields. And we have to use the, possible, the largest possible electrical field to get the, um, the largest possible acceleration. Um, to deflect it, we could use both electrical and magnetic field, but it's just much easier to create large magnetic field, so we use magnetic field. And how do we do that in practice? Here you see two elements used to accelerate particles. So, so these are, I will come back to this structure, which is a click structure. This is a different structure used for uh, superconducting machines. And here you see two magnets. This is the magnets we used in LHC, which bend the particles around the LHC. So it's a so-called dipole magnet. This is created by, by the highest possible current, and then you get a magnetic field through the coils of electrical current. And they are superconducting to get the highest possible current, because then we get the highest possible magnetic field. Uh, and this is a quadrupole magnet, which is focusing particles. So we do not only bend the particles, we also focus them. Because what we are looking at is not a single particle, but groups of particles, which comes along at a certain distance. And there are some, roughly like a billion, there's a, a billion particles in each package. So this is how we do it. Uh, we take a stable particle, uh, electron, positron, proton, most used, and we steer them with the help of electrical and magnetic field. And then it's a question of technology. What is the best technology to use? And what gives us the, uh, the best possible accelerator at the end? Now, I will going to talk about electron-positron accelerators. And, and we, for electron-positron accelerators, um, we have a particular limitation. But in fact, uh, there is, there's a phenomenon called synchrotron radiation, and this is loss of energy when you bend the particle. So if you bend the particle like that, it will lose energy. And at some point you will be limited by, your acceleration cannot put in more energy than is being lost by bending it. This effect is described by this formula and is increasing very quickly with energy, but it's also uh, proportional to one over the mass to the fourth power, telling us that this is a particular significant problem for light particles. And it happens that the electron is t a factor 2,000 lighter than protons. So this is a much bigger problem for electrons and positrons than for protons. So if you want to study in detail uh, particles in collisions with electrons and positrons, you reach the conclusion that as you go up in energy, if you try to bend them around a ring, you have to expand the ring uh, enormously. So you have to increase the radius to compensate for this loss in radiation. So the cost of such a machine as you go up in energy just takes off, it explodes. So if you want to go to high energy with electrons and positrons, you have only one choice, you have to go to a linear accelerator. And of course, in this region, you can dispute which one is the best. So this is much less of a problem with protons, but it's also going to be a, pro a problem if you go to really high energies in a proton ring at a certain size. Uh, because the only way to compensate is to go for a very large ring, and then also the cost there will, will increase. But for protons, you are more limited by the magnetic field to keep the particles going around in a circle. So now I'm finally to the linear accelerator. So we got to the linear accelerator by wanting electrons and positrons, and by the fact of radiation losses, uh, the linear accelerator is the best, or in fact the only option. So. So now I will go into the details of such a, well, details. I will go into the main elements of a, of a linear accelerator. So the, this is a generic linear collider. And we start, let's start with the electrons first. You, so you start with, a, with electrons. And in fact, you don't start with a single electron. You, you start with the groups of, of electrons. And in fact, in click, you have trains of particles, and inside these trains you have groups. And inside each of these groups you have 10 to the 9 particles, so a billion electrons. In fact, 5 times 10 to the 9 particles. So you have these groups of particles coming along, and you have to make them all um, behave in the same way. You, uh, and you, to do that, you put, into, put them into a, what is called a damping ring. I will explain a little bit 
uh, how a damping ring works. Then you have to transport them to the end of the, of the, of the LINAC, and then you accelerate, and you accelerate as much as you can. Because you only have one chance, these particles pass, not as in a circular accelerator many times, they pass only once. So you pass, you accelerate as much as you can, and then you want to have as many collisions as possible. Because even though you have a billion electrons there and a billion positrons there, when they collide, it's very difficult to get a real, uh, they, they get close enough to have a real interaction. So you make the beams as small as possible. So you screen the, squeeze them in something called the beam delivery system. And this is a formula for the intensity, and I, I don't want you to, to understand that formula, but there are two key, key elements of getting this size of the beam as small as possible. One is that the particles from the start are behaving in a uniform way, like a fish school. They all move the same way. And then that you manage to squeeze them with the help of focusing magnets in the last in fact, several kilometers. This little thing here is two, three kilometers long. So that's the key for getting the, high, the intensity uh, up. So the key elements of this is to create what we call low emittance beams here, uh, and then transport this well-behaved beam to the main LINAC. And of course, you have to do the same for the positrons, which is in fact more difficult, but I will not go into that. Then you have to accelerate. So the key parameter is the energy increase per length. And then you have to supply the energy from the wall. You need a lot of energy. You need megawatts of energy as efficient as possible to the accelerating elements. This is a key difficulty uh, for any accelerator. And for Click, we have to take uh, a particular uh, solution for that, which in fact also many other accelerators are going for, is to have a, another beam intermediate to deliver this, uh, this uh, uh, power. And then the fact is that you create these extremely small uh, beams at the end, you squeeze them in the beam delivery systems. So that's the key elements, and I will show a couple of slides for each of these challenges. So the first thing is the damping ring. And there we, we use the experiments for what we call a light source. A light source is a, an electron uh, ring, I will show it a bit later, which is used for a different purpose. It's used to, uh, by manipulating the beam to create photons and you use it to study uh, materials. So what you do there, you have a, a particle which is not behaving absolutely correctly, is not moving along the axis of the beam, is moving a little bit like that. Then you, we call it um, Viglos. We, this is magnetic fields oscillating. You reduce the energy of that particle and then you re-accelerate. And then you get uh, a final uh, particle which is more going in the right direction. So that's, that's the basic principle of the damping rings. Uh, and here is an example of a, of a, a light source, in fact. Uh, it's the Alba light source in Barcelona, which is basically such a ring. Uh, but as I said, it's used for a different purpose. Uh, they inject electrons. They send them around in an electron ring. And then uh, by bending them and manipul manipulating the electrons, you get photons. And then you do all kinds of studies of materials uh, in, in this ring. And here you see it in, in, in real life and inside. So, so in fact, in the Click project, we work with the team at ALBA, which do studies for this damping ring in general, including this acceleration system, which is needed to, to create this uh, well-behaved beam. And we also do a study of something called an extraction kicker, for, because in our case, we will take that beam at some point and kick it out of the ring and into our main uh, uh, straight uh, linear accelerator. And this is done uh, with a collaboration between CERN, uh, ALBA, but also EFIC Valencia has been central in the development of, the, of this device. The next, uh, the next uh, difficulty is related to power. So in a, most accelerators, the power is in fact coming from uh, something creating a pulse, and then you have a, a high frequency klystone, it's called, which modulates it. So we have a, in our case, we need a 12 gigahertz frequency. And these are little accelerators on themselves. And the difficulty with this method is that you need, in the case of click, you will need something like, uh, e even for the initial stake, eight kilometers of these devices. And they are very expensive. We are talking maybe a million 
uh, a million Swiss francs per piece, and eight kilometers of that, they have a lifetime which is limited. So the, they will always have some of them breaking. So in our case, for click, we have chosen another method. But generally, uh, we also use them in a, in a more sophisticated way to create the power. Then we put that power into a structure. And we make sure that we get a, a, an oscillating electrical field inside this structure. Uh, and we make sure we pass the particle in phase with this oscillating wave, such that the particle, when it goes through there, uh, electrons one way, positrons the other way, they see this wave and they get a kick. And the, the key is to get them the ma maximum possible kick. So it's a bit like a surfer on a wave, which gains speed from the wave. <clears throat> So how do we do that? What is, the, what is the maximum we can do? Here there's a bunch of technologies, but what we have decided to use for click is uh, what we call a warm technology, a room temperature, a copper structure. With superconducting structures, you don't go so high in accelerating gradient, but it has other advantages. But for click, we have decided to use uh, work in this parameter space, which means that we have to have short pulses because we put in a lot of power into a copper structure and it will heat up, basically. So there's a limit how long the pulses can be, and that's why we have this fine structure of half a nanosecond, and so on and so on. So it's all driven by the maximum acceleration we can get per meter. And this is the structure. It's built out of disks, extremely precisely machined disks uh, to micrometer level. They are stacked up and they're put into a structure like that. So this is roughly, as you see, uh, 20, 30, uh, 25 to 30 centimeter long, consisting of 26 disks in this direction. And then we pump power into them at 12 gigahertz, and the particles go through in a ring in the middle, in a hole in the middle of these structures, this little hole here, and we put the maximum electrical field into there, limited it by how much the copper structure can, can handle of, of fields. So here is a, a little example of that. I assume you are a particle coming here. You see this field here, now pointing. You get a kick here. You move along. You get a kick here. You move along. You get another kick here, and, and so on. So as you move along, and if you do the frequency and the phasing correctly, you keep accelerating these particles uh, faster and more and more. Now, how mature is this technology? These are the institutes in the world which either uh, build these kind of structures, they are in green, uh, and or are able to test them. Because to test them, you have to put an, uh, a lot of power into them and run them for a long, long time to see that you don't have discharges on the surface of these, of these, uh, of these structures. So the key for building the building capabilities is this which is an industrial capability. This is made in industry and, in some cases, assembled in these institutes. And the testing capability is big power elements. It's a klystron, as I showed earlier, which pump power into this structure, and then we measure the behavior of this structure. And also here, Spain is, is uh, significantly involved, CMAT here in Madrid, together with a company up in the north, DMT, are working on a prototype for this accelerating structure. That's why Spain is there. And in Valencia, one is building up testing capacity, a system similar to that, but not for click, uh, using the technology from click, but it's really done for structures, accelerating structure like that, slightly different, uh, with a different frequency, which we'll use for hadron therapy. So I will come back to that later on. Then, um, then finally, we have to think about how to get the power in. And there, we have to do something special. Because as, we, as I try to explain to you, to just pump the power in, as it's done in a conventional accelerator, do not work. We will have too many failures. It will be too costly. So we have to do something else. So what we introduced in Click, so this is the Click accelerator, main accelerator, like this. We have, and these beams are created on the surface. They are sent down. They are turned around. They're sent down and turned around. But we have a second accelerator. We have a, what they call a drive beam, uh, which is shown in, in red here. And we 
amplify that beam. So this is very high intensity beam, a lot of particles, but low energy. And then we amplify it further with the help of, of what we call combiner rings. And we send it around there and we turn it around like that. So in fact, for a certain, uh, for a certain length there, the drive beam goes parallel to the main beam. And then we extract the beam, the energy from this intense beam into the main beam. And the reason we do that is that to get with klystrons, beam into the drive beam is very efficient because we have very long pulses and we have a structure of the beam which is well suited for that. And if we need to increase the energy of the accelerator, we don't need to do anything with that. We just made the pulse longer so we can have one more group of particles going there. Here you see the depth profile. Here's LHC and you see click below that along the side of the Dura Mountains. So this is the implementation of it. And in fact, uh, this is the trick we do with this drive beam. So we have a long pulse like that, split into 24 different groups of pulses, and we take 23 of them and we put them inside that one. So we increase the frequency inside that pulse by a factor 24, and we increase the intensity inside that pulse for 24. And then we send one pulse here, and we send one pulse there. So we send them along to the different parts of the accelerator. So this means that we have to have a power extraction unit and move the power over to the main accelerator. And all this is to have a higher power efficiency and to be able to have a, a machine which is easily expandable, because you can do that, as I said, by making this pulse longer. So here you see the drive beam going parallel, transferring in a copper structure power into the main beam. And in fact, if you, here you see a simulation of what's happening. So here you see this drive beam coming into this power extraction unit, and you know, can notice the time scale here. This is within, uh, within um, three nanoseconds. In fact, the pulse length is 240 nanoseconds. So it takes something like 70 nanoseconds to build up uh, a, uh, a good acceleration field in this structure, and then we've come with the main beam and pass it through synchronously with this RF power, as we call it. We call it RF because it's, it has the frequency, it's at a radio frequency, but there's no deeper meaning of that uh, than it's a certain frequency range. So here you see the pulses being built up, and in fact, if you keep running this film up to uh, 70 nanoseconds or so, you have conditions in this main accelerating structure which is suitable then for the main, for the main beam. Okay, we have tested this concept. In fact, it's the key concept of click in some ways to get the power efficiency in. This allows us to go to higher energy. And so we have a test facility where we create a drive beam with a combiner ring and we send them into a test area where we have a main beam and we have a module to test all this concept. And we have proven that, in fact, the limitation of this, of this technology is not really coming from here. It's coming from the fundamental limits of electrical fields towards this copper structure. So we can get significantly higher energy uh, kicks than what we need for, for click, in fact, with this method. Uh, here you see this, uh, exactly this type of structure, a dry beam transferring energy to the main beam. And as I said, we go we want to be at 100 megavolt per meter, which is a measure of how much we can accelerate. And then finally, nanobeams. These beams are extremely small when we combine them and in, in, collide them. In fact, we, we want them uh, small in both dimensions, but it turns out to be more profitable to be small in one dimension and slightly bigger in another one. So in the, in the, in the vertical dimension, we, the beam is one nanometer wide, which is the size of a, of a water molecule. And in the other dimension is, is 40 nanometers. The beams in LHC and many other accelerators are still very small. They're like a hair. If, for those of you who have hair, you can take out a hair. And this is what we collide. We collide two hairs, which are roughly a few centimeters long in, in LHC. But in click, the situation is much worse. We have to collide water mole molecules, a bit wide water molecules with another molecules, after accelerating it for 25 kilometers. So this is very, very difficult. And of course, this is a, an important R&D. So what we do 
to solve this, first of all, we need to align all components of the machine. To, to, uh, and this, of course, we can test. We, can, we build a test set for that. Um, and I will show the, the pictures of, of how we do that. We have to control and damp vibrations. In fact, the earth is shaking uh, wherever you go, even down in the tunnel. And you have to make sure that these vibrations are uh, in a certain frequency range are not transmitted to the accelerator elements so we can test vibration systems. Then we measure beam positions. We have to measure where the beam is and either move the element or steer the beam to make sure we know exactly where it is. And this is an example of measuring with the help of these couplers on the surface of a structure where the beam is because you get an electrical signal depending on where inside the beam, inside the structure the beam goes. And then we have a lot of algorithms for measurements, beam components, optimization, and feedbacks. And then we test them in small systems, relatively small system compared to click, to make sure that we can really collide this type of beams. So now I think I come uh, basically to the end of the first part. And we will move uh, with uh, Dr. Lucy Linson into detector and physics. And then I will come back at the very end. I will say, show a, a, a few slides about how we use this type of technology in other type of accelerators. Because obviously, when you push technology, this opens possibilities in other areas. And I will talk a little bit about the timeline of how CLIC could be implemented. So just to illustrate the point again, this is not a, done by CERN alone. It's done by a collaboration of, of something like 50 institutes um, and, uh, and uh, all over the world. Uh, and you see the countries and uh, flags of these different institutes here. Then I, I stop and give the word to, to Lucy to continue. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I think it's a big honor to be here and also to see that there's foundations that do help uh, fundamental science. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real honor. So I will uh, continue in telling you a little bit more about the electron-positron collisions and about the detectors that we use to study these collisions. So we'll start and repeat a short introduction on the physics. Again, compare proton versus electron colliders. Say something about particle detections, what a click detector will look like, something about detector technologies that we are developing for this collider. And then I will give a snapshot of what click can really then do for all our physics questions. So this presentation obviously is possible thanks to the material provided by my colleagues from the Click DP from the Click Detector and Physics collaboration. Okay, so we're back on the elementary particles and inter interactions. So what you see here is again the list of all the particles that we know of, the ex elementary particles that we know of. And um, these consist of quarks and leptons, each in three families. Then we have a number of particles that carry the forces, strong nuclear interactions uh, by the gluon, electromagnetic interactions by the photon, and electroweak interactions by the W and Z particles. And then there's, of course, the Higgs. Many of these particles have been discovered decades ago. And we, in the various accelerators, we have been able to measure them extremely accurately. Sometimes we measure phenomena to precision of a per mil or even a millions of accuracy. But this doesn't hold for all of them. And funny enough, um, we, we lack accuracy on the heaviest particles because those are also the particles that we discovered latest. And it's these heaviest particles that are our best messages of new physics. So anything beyond the standard model that we know will be shown by, this, by the behavior of these very heavy particles. So for any next accelerator, and of course also for the ILC, we are after these heavy particles to tell us how they interact and to a very high accuracy. Now in this scheme, one can also still make a dis distinction, one draw a line here 
On this side, we have particles with a spin one half, we call them fermions, and on this side, we have bosons with spin zero and one, and these particles behave quite differently. And this is, of course, used in our, in our research. And there's huge differences in mass between the various particles. The neutrinos carry almost no mass, and there's a huge scientific program specifically for, for neutrinos ongoing. Okay, coming back to the Higgs. So the Higgs is quite a special particle. It's a cornerstone of our standard model of particle physics. It's the, it's the particle that we have been looking for for a very long time. It's very new and it needs to be fully understood. As it carries first, we have to confirm that this is the Higgs and it behaves like the Higgs as we predicted it. It's moreover the only particle with spins zero, so it's quite different from the others. And it's the Higgs field, it's the Higgs that gives masses to the other particles. And the Higgs coupling to any other particle is proportional to the mass of that particle. Now we can study the coupling of the Higgs by, by for example, production of the Higgs. You have two particles and together they create the Higgs. Now at this triangular point here, you are dealing with the coupling of those particles to the Higgs. You can also, once you have produced the Higgs, you can study its decay. There again, at this triangular point, you can study the coupling of the Higgs to that particular particle. Any small deviation from the theory on these couplings is a messenger for new physics. And here you see just a simple uh, result of a simulation of study of these couplings at click. So here you see the particle mass of the, ma of the particles that we know, which are depicted here. And here is the coupling to the Higgs. And you see this linear dependence. You can also see that this is a logarithmic scale. So you, that tells you that the masses of the various particles can be very, very different. And it's a challenge to, to study all these things in one environment. Then particles are given mass through the Higgs field, the so-called Higgs field generated by the Higgs particle. The Higgs field is everywhere and helps to generate mass to the particles. And the Higgs field can in fact only be measured in the so-called Higgs self-coupling. And this is a diagram like this one, but this time the Higgs disintegrate in two other Higgses. The probability for this reaction is extremely low and it will be difficult to measure at any collider. But CLIC current, currently offers the best perspective for this measurement in a given luminosity, so in a given scenario of a number of years of, of measurement. So coming back to electrons and protons, so here you see a, a cartoon of a proton. The proton is composed of three quarks that are held together by gluons. So the proton, in fact, is not an elementary particle. This is different for the electron and its antiparticle, the positron. Those are real elementary particles to our knowledge. So, as uh, Dr. Steiner's, Stat, Steiner Stadness described, the, the, the accelerators that we can build best are in fact proton and electron accelerators. Now, if you generate proton-proton collisions, then you in fact generate collisions between, for example, one quark of one proton and a gluon of the opposite proton, or an interaction between two, pro, two quarks or two, two gluons. But in fact, when the interaction takes place, you don't know which fraction of the mass is carried by that particular quark, because as you see, it changes all the time. So you don't know the initial state of the reaction very good. And this limits your achievable precision. This is different for electrons and positrons. As they are point-like, the initial state is actually defined by the, the accelerator itself. And you can even give them a polarization. So this allows you to do high precision measurements. Then protons have very high rates of interactions of a particular type, mostly the strong nuclear interaction. And this, I will come back to this on the next slide. And this forces you to be very detailed in finding the inter in interesting interactions in a huge heap of more standard interactions. And this then also leads to high levels of radiation in your detectors. 
in, in electron positron colliders, your environment is much more clean. You don't need to search so much and you profit from lower radiation levels. Protons have high cross sections for colored states, so for strong nuclear interactions, whereas electrons have superior sensitivity to other interactions, electroweak interactions. So the two machines are really fully complementary. Okay, so just to illustrate a little bit more the difficulty of doing experiments with proton collisions, is you have here a plot of cross-section. Cross-section is in fact probability that an interaction occurs. On the vertical axis, you have the cross-section, and on the horizontal axis, you have the collision energy. Please note the logarithmic scale with many, many orders of magnitude. So if you have a proton interaction, the total probability uh, for interaction sits here. Where is the Higgs production sits here. Then, if you look in detail, you have a factor of more than 100 million of probability difference between the two. So this makes your experimentation in proton collisions more difficult. If you compare it with the electrons, so again here, you have probability, it's a somewhat different scale, and collision energy. And here you see the main interesting interactions mostly with Higgs and top particles. They sit here. And the largest cross-section process sits here. The click energy range is here. And you can see immediately, while these most frequent Higgs processes are here, so you can see immediately that it's somewhat easier to do an experiment at click and that the events will be more clean. Now, what physics do we want to do at the Eclic E plus E minus collider? We want to do accurate measurements of known physics. This can be the Higgs particle or the top quark, which is in fact the heaviest particle that we know of. It was discovered in the United States in proton-proton collisions um, in 1995, 1996. And it has only been measured in proton collisions. We never had the opportunity to have an electron collider with enough energy to study the, the, the top quark. Then, of course, we want to search for new physics. We want to look for direct searches. Are there new particles being created in our new accelerator? And we can study through indirect searches by studying some processes to very high accuracy. Now, if you then make, again, a plot of cross-section versus collision energy, then you can see that it can be very advantageous to run, build, and operate the click accelerator in three steps. If you start at this center of mass energy, 380 GeV, then you can study accurately some of the Higgs physics and top quark physics, and you can look for new physics to see whether it exists already at that energy. If you, then you move up to one and a half TV, you can start measuring this famous Higgs self-coupling, which is related to the Higgs field. You, you have good chances to do further studies on top quarks and even study the coupling between the top and the Higgs and again look for new physics. And then you build your final accelerator with 50 kilometers length and continue your searches. Now, if you then look at the implementation as Steiner Stadnes has shown it already here, then you can see with these various center, center of mass energies you see the length of the facility, 11 kilometers, 29 kilometers, 50 kilometers. So you can make an upgradable facility. And the number of Higgs events that you create in approximately four years is 100,000 to about one and a half million. I will now give you a short introduction to particle detectors, because of course you have to measure the interactions. Particle detection. So many of the pa elementary particles that we know have actually very short lifetime. So not all of these particles that I showed you in the initial diagram can be measured directly. Many of, many of them, they, as they are created, they almost immediately disintegrate. And they disintegrate into a small number of known particles. So for example, the Higgs, we will never see it directly. We only see its decay products. Same for the W and the Z and many more. And in particular, 
all the quarks, all the quarks that we have, they hadronize, which means as they are created, they immediately disintegrate in a wealth of particles. And they give some kind of shower of particles immediately, which we call a jet. Here you have an example of a jet. But then sometimes inside such a jet, you can have another decay, which takes place just a few millimeters after its creation. And we use this to try to learn more about the interactions. Here you see some image of a jet. Now the whole trick of, of our trade is to reconstruct the original particles from the visible decay the products. And this is the key ingredient to our particle detectors. So particles, we cannot see them, even with the best microscope, they are so small, we will not be able to see them. But as particles travel through material, they will leave a tiny little signal, extremely small. This can be little ionization, or some atomic effect, or nuclear effect, but in any case, it's very small. Different particles behave in a different way when they interact with matter. And that we, we use to make a kind of trick box to understand which particles we are actually observing in our detector. So for example, if you take a photon and you send it through your detector, and we naively just make the detector of a device that we call the tracker, which just measures a number of points where a particle has passed, which shows you in which direction the particle is leaving the interaction, but also how much uh, momentum it has, how much quantity of motion it has, because we will apply a magnetic field here. And then we follow this tracker by two types of very heavy passive active sandwich structures in which the particles start disintegrating but they all disintegrate in a different way. And so it helps us to understand who is who. And then there is even a last part, which is a kind of crude detector, but it helps in understanding, as you will see. So if you take a particle of light, the photon, in the tracker, as the photon is not charged, it will not show anything. But as soon as it enters this heavy material, it will create a shower of particles that we detect in the sandwich structure. If, on the contrary, it's an electron, as it is charged, it behaves more or less like a photon here, but it leaves a trace. If you have a muon, it's a different lepton, a different particle, it will just go all the way through and will leave a small signal in all of our detectors. If it's a proton or a pion, it will leave a trace and it will disintegrate, but it will disintegrate later and in a larger shower. It will do, just behave differently. Then if you move to the neutron, as it's neutral, it will not leave a trace here, but it will disintegrate like the proton. And then we have the elusive neutrino, which will just go all the way through your detector, and you will not detect it. But what you will detect is that you miss some energy, that some energy went somewhere and you didn't see it. So that's the way we built our detectors. Now to do this in an optimal way, in the tracker, we want to be extremely precise in measuring these tracks. So we want this tracker to be very, very precise and extremely light, such that the particles just leave a little signal, but they don't get perturbed by material. Whereas after that, we want a lot of detection material, but also a structure that is extremely heavy. And that's the tricks we use. Now, this is not different from any particle detector. So what you see here is a cut through the CMS experiment uh, at the LHC. Look at the scale here. So this is the interaction point, and it goes all the way to seven meters. And it starts with the tracker, the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hadron calorimeter, the field for the magnet, just such that these tracks are curved. Then if the particle has a positive charge, it's curved one way. If it has a negative charge, it will be curved in the other direction. And then you get the muon detectors that are pretty crude. The click detector will have a structure that is very similar to the CMS LHC detector. However, the, our detector has to be more accurate as the, as the collisions are more accurate. We have to keep up with the challenge and make a more accurate de detector. And this is possible thanks to new technologies and in particular semiconductor technologies. 
a detector for the click. So for the moment, we only have our mockups and our simulation models, but we are working very hard to make the best possible plans and designs and to develop the technologies that we, have, that we need to make these accurate detectors. So this is what the detector looks like, and it's just a repetition of what I showed before. So you have the electron coming from this side, the positron coming from the other side, and they collide in the center of the detector. Look at the scale here. The detector is a bit less than 12 meters long. Surrounding the interaction point, you have an ultra low mass vertex detector with very small pixels. It's pixels like in your photo camera, but it's still a bit different, and I will tell you later. Then, surrounding the pixel detector, you have the, the larger tracker with a radius of one and a half meter. And this is again semiconductor detectors where the particles, the charged particles, leave a very small signal. And then we start with the heavy stuff. And that's a sandwich of very heavy material, tungsten or steel, interleaved with active material. Then the, the, the superconducting coil to create our strong magnetic field. And then at the end, the iron return yoke of the coil and our muon identification detectors. Going to the pixel detector and the tracker, they measure direction and momentum of particles and of course their charge. They have to be extremely accurate and light. Just to take the example of the pixel detector, it will have two billion pixels, three micron measurement accuracy, so one over three hundredths of a millimeter, 25 by 25 micron pixel sizes, which is 25 times smaller than the area of the pixels used in the LHC. Each individual pixel needs to measure pulse height of the signal left by the particle, and also very accurate timing to 100 millionths of a second of when the particle passed, and it has to be ultra light. Now the two billion pixels, you don't need to be impressed because our fantastic photo cameras provide these kind of uh, service as well. What is different in our case is that in the vertex detectors, the signal deposited by the particles is much, much smaller than the signal the light is deposited on our photo camera. Moreover, we need individual, complete electronic signals, uh, sig chains for each individual pixel, while your photo camera generally deposits a picture on the pixel array, and then the, the image is read out sequentially, line by line and column by column. We cannot do this. We have to have a full electronic signal circuit for every pixel. So the technologies involved are very thin silicon sensors, extremely thin, which gives you a very low signal, full e electronic si circuit per pixel, ultralight power delivery and cables, if not you put too much material, ultralight supports, and they should be air stable with air cooling just to carry the heat away of the electronics. This is high-tech R&D. It covers many disciplines, and it has spin-off to other fields. So here I put just some images of what we are doing. So we're testing all kinds of semiconductor technology to see whether we can make the pixels smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner and measure still with very high accuracy without these devices dissipating a lot of heat. Because if they dissipate a lot of heat, we have to cool. And to cool, you need tubes and liquids, and this is all too heavy for our, for our pur purpose. So we do many, many tests and simulations and designs to push the technology to what we need. Quite a lot of the requirements for CLIC have been achieved one by one, but our challenge is to put all these requirements together in one device. And we are not yet there, but we have time. So we work, for example, also on interconnect technologies, powering with power pulsing, turning the power on and off 50 times per second just to save on heat dissipation, telescopes to test these particles, very thin devices for support. So these studies are done in Valencia, like these ones and this one to look at very thin supports and see how we can manage the construction of this extremely accurate and extremely thin detectors. And this is an air cooling test device. Now, our work also provides some spin-off. 
So this is an image of an astronaut working near one of our pixel detectors, a pixel detectors that was developed for linear collider tracking applications. It was developed around 2007 or so. And this detector is now used for ma in many applications, radiation monitoring at accelerators and in space, material sci science, so X-ray imaging, mass spectrometry and proton research, beam and radiation dose monitoring and hadron therapy. So the, the technologies that we develop, we do an effort to make sure that society profits from them. Here you see the little CERN logo on the device. Calorimeters have to be very heavy. So we need sandwiches, which have heavy material, active material, heavy material, active material. We do this in about 60 layers. And uh, this will become very heavy and compact and will give us about 80 million uh, readout channels. So that's four times, 400 times more than at the LHC. Here you see the size of the devices we are testing in our test beams and the kind of images of these showers that the particles create in this material, how we can detect them and then analyze them. So what we really want, I talked about the jet of originated by quarks. This means that you have many particles very close by, whereas the particles are very often closer by than the extent of their showers in the calorimeter. Now, if you have very detailed information, you will be able, with the information of the calorimeter and very powerful software programs, to really detect every individual particle here and get the best out of your measurement. This was not yet possible at the LHC because the technologies didn't exist, but now they exist. And this is tested on a large uh, number of prototypes. And here you see just some examples of the tests that are being carried out with different active materials, with different passive materials to see how we can do this at best and how also we can keep the cost at a limited level. Now the work was done for the linear colliders, but meanwhile, the LHC is looking into upgrades of their detector. And this is again an image of the CMS detector in open position, and this is their forward calorimeter. This calorimeter, after 10, 15 years of operation, will have too much radiation damage and will need to be replaced. And CMS has now decided to look at the technology that was developed for the linear colliders and use it in their upgrade. So it's another example of spin-off, although it's in our own field. Now a little snapshot of how well we can do the physics at Click with those detectors. So again, a plot of probability against center of mass energy with different processes involving the Higgs with the large H. Now there's one process that is extremely favorable and is well, very well known, well, well used in future E plus E minus colliders, and it doesn't even require the highest center of mass energy. This is the so-called Higgs stralung. So you have the electron and the positron. They create a Z particle, and the Z particle just radiates a Higgs. Now, as you know this very well from your accelerator, and as you can measure this in your detector, in fact, you don't need to look at the Higgs. You can just see the Higgs by looking at the Z only, because you see there's something missing in your interaction. And, that, and then you try to measure that and see what you get. And this provides your model independent Higgs measurement. You don't need to assume anything about the Higgs, and yet you can see it. And you can see this invisible Higgs decay to 1% accuracy or better. And that gives you this plot here. Uh, so this is number of events and the kind of missing energy, the missing mass in your, in your detector, where you have some background, the signal, and the combination of the two is here. Now, maybe if you remember the plots of when the Higgs was discovered at the LHC, this was by far not such a beautiful plot. It was a huge background with a tiny, tiny signal on top that could well be analyzed statistically, but here you can reach much higher accuracy. So if we then take several of these interactions together, here it's Higgs production, here it's Higgs production. 
Here is coupling of the Higgs to the top. At the different energies it click. Then I display here the projected accuracy of the coupling. And this line here corresponds to 2.5% accuracy. And here you have the total probability of interaction and then the different known particles coupling to the Higgs. And you can see that many of them in the full click program can be measured to better than about 1%. And if you compare with what the LHC can do, I put this in a color code. So if the color code is green, the accuracy will be significantly better than in the upgrade of the LHC. If it's orange, the accuracy will be comparable to what the LHC will do. Then the famous Higgs coupling, where Higgs is created and, it, and, two Higgs, and decays into two Higgses. This gives access to the understanding of the Higgs field, which is extremely important for our theory. This can, measurement can be done to just 10% accuracy at click, but this is better than most other options. So here you see some images of interactions here in our detector. So here you see E plus E minus to Higgs and two neutrinos. The neutrinos you will not see. The Higgs will decay to two B quarks. The two B quarks give you uh, jets of particles that we can reconstruct in the detector. You can also see that this in interaction is just not balanced. Normally, if you make an interaction, you should get the particles in opposite direction. The fact that the particles go in one direction means there's other particles that you don't see that went in the other direction, and those are the neutrinos. Similar, this is an event where you measure the coupling of the Higgs to the top quark. And this is a much more complicated event. It has at least seven such jets, but you can see, you can kind of recognize, and you can imagine that if you have powerful reconstruction programs, you will very, do very well in reconstructing this. Then other physics at, at, at click. So I mentioned the top quark. So the top quark uh, mass is now known to one factor in 400 or so at present. And we can do this much better at uh, linear colliders by looking at the probability of creating the top mass as a function of, of energy. Also, we can see whether, for example, the Higgs has neighbors. Does it have partner particles, which are heavy? If they would exist, and within a certain mass range, we could detect them very accurately at click. Then our collaboration. So the Click Detector and Physics Study is a collaboration hosted by CERN. It has 27 institutes from 17 countries, and you see them displayed here. So we focus on click-specific studies, so physics prospects, prospects detector optimization in simulations, and detector technology R&D, as I showed. We do this in close cooperation with other projects. We don't do this in isolation. It just doesn't make sense. Particle physics needs many of these advantages, not only for CLIC, but also for other projects. So we do this together with LHC upgrades, with the uh, International Linear Collider, which is also a linear E plus E and minus collider, which was mentioned by Dr. Juan Fuster and by Steiner Stapnes, and also the large circular collider that is being studied at CERN. Now, within ClickDP, we have a Spanish participation. It's a so-called Spanish National Network for Future Linear Colliders, which is a very nice effort to team the, the effort within Spain for these colliders and make sure that once these detectors have to be built, Spain can offer to participate together in one particular field. Now, many institutes are uh, involved in this network. I have listed them here. Uh, the Spanish groups are our experts on, on top physics. There's quite some work done in theoretical physics. Then in detector hardware, there's detailed work on silicon detectors, tracker mechanics, and pixel detector mechanics, but also in fine grain calorimetry. That brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. Of course, I would not be able to show all this without the participation of these young guys that work in our team. 
Now, be reassured, we don't have a, a, a prescribed costume uh, for people working on this study. This photograph was to taken at the occasion of the yearly race around CERN, where people run in, a, in an estafette. I now hand the word again to Dr. Steiner Stapnes, and I thank you for your attention. So I will, I will be short, I promise you. It's been a long evening and I will now, but what I would like to say a little bit about is how the technology, the accelerator technology can be used in other projects. And I will show some examples of that. And I think that also has some interest, in fact, for Spain, as you will see. So one, I mentioned the rings like ALBA, which is used for creating light to study material, pharmaceuticals, uh, for studies of, uh, in, in many different fields. This is called the third generation light sources. But the trend today in many countries around the world is to consider what they call fourth generation light sources. And they are, some of them are already operational and several of them in, are in construction. And the key for these, of course, is to make them uh, smaller, uh, cheaper, and more performant. And of course, the click technology offer the potential of doing that for some of the key parameters. So a light source is basically a, a linear accelerator. So it has a source, you accelerate the particles, then you wiggle the particles in the magnetic field, uh, oscillating magnetic fields, and you create laser light. And then you build experiments behind that to study different objects. And here's an example from, from a, the, one of the first machines of this type at, at Stanford, at Slack. Uh, where you see that the studies here is not only in particle physics, there's some in physics, but there's a lot in what is called life sciences, chemistry, materials, instrumentation, engineering, optics, earth and environmental science. And I'm sure the, the discussion will come at some point in Spain. You have a light source of the third generation, should you have a light source of the fourth generation as well. So of course, if you look at this different light source, uh, this is the same one from, from Stanford, which is several kilometers long. Here you see one in, in Switzerland, which is uh, now down to something like 700 meters. And here you see a concept from Shanghai, uh, where they have a third generation light source, and they're considering uh, a fourth generation uh, light source nearby. But they only have 580 meters available, both for the accelerator and the experiments. So the key here is to get, uh, and in fact, these are all based on these copper structures, but they operate at different frequency. And the push here is to go more compact, get the price down, increase the repetition rates, and make short pulses, which is right in the ballpark of the click technology. So we try to work with all these, uh, uh, and in fact, these are collaboration members. Um, all these three are, in fact, collaboration members of click, where we, we work together with them. And in fact, these are also provide a lot of feedback to us about, about the technology. Here is a really small accelerator. So if you want a very small light source, this is what is called a tabletop accelerator, where you have a tiny little accelerator and you collide it with a laser beam, in fact, in this box behind here. So you have a small uh, linear accelerator, you have a laser, and then the electrons will kick the uh, photon forward and you get an X-ray pulse. Uh, and in fact, we have several collaborators. This picture is from Tsinghua in, in Beijing. It's a very powerful and, and efficient group, and, and they are, have such a facility in, in, uh, in their facility, such a facility at the university. This is something a university can afford and build. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was such a project in Holland, and the main purpose of the one in Holland is to inspect pictures, like the beautiful pictures you see around here, to see are these really true pictures of the master? Is there something behind, or are they false? So there are the museums in, in, in Amsterdam are very interested in this type of development. Um, medicine. There is a push in irradiation, cancer uh, treatment, to, where a lot of uh, the irradiation is based on x-rays, to use protons and carbon. So this, if you see, uh, this is water, and this is particle energy deposition of particles in water. And you see for x-rays, 
it drops, it goes up to a, a little bit and then it drops off like that. Which means if you send that into the body and the tumor is at this depth, uh, most of the energy is deposited not where it should be. It's deposited outside the tumor. So they compensate for that by shooting in uh, uh, gamma rays from, um, shooting in uh, X-rays from different angles to create um, maximum irradiation in the tumor in this particular case. You can use protons or, you know, in fact, carbon ions, carbon ions are, are also very efficient or even more efficient in some ways, but very difficult to, to deal with. And then you can, with four beams of protons in this case, you can save this uh, area around in a much better way. And I've taken one slide, which is in fact from, um, from uh, our collaborators in, in Valencia, where they are studying using, uh, putting an entire uh, LINAC like that, a linear accelerator, on a rotating arm. So this will be the patient, this will be the beam, and the big instrument, which is called a gantry, rotates around the patient and shoots in protons from different directions. And this work is also being done for uh, uh, in a different study, but by the same group for carbon ions. And, and um, one of the reasons why the Valencia group is involved in the CLIC is in fact to be able to have full knowledge about this technology, and they make a big contribution to our project, but also uh, to be able to build up their own test facilities for this type of projects. Now, so this was, this was three examples of, of accelerators where pushing compactness and price are the key elements. That's the, really the reason why you would implement such a system or not. Click is not alone pushing the linear accelerator or linear collider uh, um, idea. And there is a long-standing project called the International Linear Collider, uh, which is in some ways similar. It has an electron and positron, has damping rings, and so on and has the accelerating parts. There are some differences. Uh, here you see the parameters for that. Uh, the main difference, uh, and the implementation considered for this project is in north of Tokyo, uh, in the northern part of Japan. And the Japanese government are in the process of evaluating this project. The main difference is in the, uh, what is called the RF, uh, RF uh, or production of, uh, of uh, energy for acceleration where they use a superconducting technology, which is roughly one third of the accelerating gradients of click. So this you see for 500 GeV, they will need 30 kilometers. Uh, so this means that this machine is perfectly suitable uh, and comparable to a click first stage. But as you go up in the energy, you run out of, 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 uh, of possibility to go to such a high energy with this technology. So we have to see if Japan is going to implement this, and of course we have to see from LHC how important is it to go to higher energy. We believe it's very important, but of course we will know quite a bit more in five years' time about that question, or even before, I, I imagine. So now, how could one implement CLIC? Can it be done? Can it be afforded, and so on? So the strategy uh, coming from the, the current CERN director is is quite clear. This is the roadmap for CERN, which is uh, encompassing the community in Europe uh, as much as possible. So the key is to exploit LHC, upgrade LHC with a high luminosity and so on. Then there are various other programs. But then the preparation for CERN future is accelerator R&D uh, in a number of technologies. There are the science studies for CLIC, for FCC, the, this large ring of, based on protons, and in fact, I think the next talk of this type will be related to F FCC. And there's also a possibility, in fact, to replace the magnets in the current LHC machine with higher field magnets and go up in energy that way. And of course, the key to all that is the results from LHC. What do we see at LHC beyond Higgs and top? Is there anything? If there's something, what energy is it at? How can you produce it in these machines and study in these machines. So what we are doing in, in the meantime is the technical development. So this means that uh, we are doing all the technical development of all these different parts and testing them in the smaller accelerator setups. And, and of course, this is only a, a sample of what I've, I've talked about. 
and our timeline is something like that. We are in the development phase of this project. Around 2019-20, when LHC is taking a break before further upgrades, one will have to evaluate the LHC data and the project plans for Click and other potential projects and make some kind of decision, if we can. We hope to be able to make some kind of direction for the future at that point. If the direction is to, <clears throat> to push on with Click and maybe increase the momentum for Click, we still need four to five years preparing before we can really go and construct such an accelerator. And one key element is to get, make sure that industries who have to produce thousands and thousands can really produce thousands and thousands of these elements for an accelerator. And then we can start constructing in, in 25. We need something like seven years to construct. We need a couple of years to tune the accelerator, getting it up to speed. And we could be ready in 2035, which is exactly the time when LHC is, going to, is foreseen to complete this program. So clearly this is, I haven't talked about money, I haven't talked about other difficulty items like that, but we try to make this scenario for the initial stage of, of CLICK, so this is the 11 kilometer, compatible with uh, LHC projects in terms of cost and the budgets we have at CERN and in Europe for particle physics, so we don't try to imagine that we have an, an enormous increase beyond what we have today. And that, I think, was uh, what I wanted to say. And again, thank you uh, to you for listening to all these uh, words and looking at all these slides, and to the collaborators, because obviously, as Lucy pointed out, this is a, a work by many collaborators who, uh, who uh, also prepared the, the pictures and the slide which we have shown her today. Thank you.